Hey guys, today I'm going to be talking about dot point 1.2. Uh, this dot point asks for the theory for evolution is supported by many uh, pieces of evidence which include paleontology, biogeography, comparative anatomy, comparative embryology, and biochemistry. So in this dot point, what it actually wants is it wants examples. So word for word, we have to describe using specific examples how the theory of evolution is supported uh, by the following areas of study, which I will go through inside this entire process. Okay, so let's start. First off, I'm going to uh, talk about paleontology, and that is the study of fossils which ultimately leads, uh, which ultimately provides evidence that living organisms have changed over time. Now, these uh, the paleontology uh, is very useful, and main reason is is because you can actually uh, derive these transitional forms, which are examples of organisms which indicate the development of one group of organisms from another or form a common ancestor. When I say common ancestor, that means that through these transitional forms, we are able to derive a common ancestor regardless of whatever animals, whatever organisms there were in between. Um, so these transitional forms actually help us in deriving this theory of a common ancestor as well as uh, the development of a group of organisms. Okay, so as this dot point asks for specific examples, what I'm really going to be focusing on is the example itself. So in paleontology, the example I used was mammal-like reptiles, which had a jawbone between that of reptiles and mammals, which were discovered in the late Permian, which is a geological period between 0 0.2 to 0 0.5 million years ago that there is evidence that these mammals, li mammal-like reptiles, s such as these uh, therops therops therapsids, were warm-blooded, which is also characteristic of mammals, and the jaw bones of the reptile, which is also the, the, called the therapsid, and mammals support this theory. So I have a little diagram here to do, just to illustrate what I'm trying to say, if my text was a little garbled. Okay, so in this diagram, you can see that from the pelicosal, um, there, there is no real... Uh, defined jaw joint, like jaw bone kind of thing. And you've got this dentary, you've got this angular and this articular. Th this is not usually found in mammals. Uh, well, yeah, it's not found in mammals. And then this fossil, which discovered these features, later on they were able to discover a fossil very similar, uh, called a therapsid, which was a reptile. Now, it became evident that all these three were from a common ancestor because all of them were like slowly developing and this transitional form allows you to see that so from here to here see this that changes to that and that changes to finally to this so um it it's not as if like there's a change but there's also like it it helps you uh illustrate actual transitional forms this diagram and that's exactly what it does so you've got the early mammal the therapsid and the pelicosaur which Ultimately, this entire aim is to aid the evidence to prove evolution. Okay, now we'll move on to biogeography. Biogeography is the study of distribution of living things. Specific plants are found in spe uh, certain continents and not others. A theory which was first described by Alfred Wallace, who's a, a very famous scientist, really, really recognized for his evolutionary findings. So, um, th th Wallace actually defined this line. Uh, as I've illustrated here, the line is over just just here near Jakarta and divides J Australia from the Asian parts. And what this line actually does is that it separates the distribution of organisms. It can be believed that Australia's unique mammals and angiosperms result from periods of isolation resulting to evolution. So that was his theory. He was, he was, his theory was that everything after this line defined many different organisms, fauna and flora, mainly faunas inside Australia compared to Asia. So, um, as I've said in this example, Wallace's line represents the boundary between the faunas of Asia and Australia. The animals and plants of Australia and Asia are very different. Okay, moving on. Comparative anatomy. Now, comparative anatomy is actually really interesting. It's the study of the differences and similarities between the structure of different organisms. Uh, the, the, these structures, they have s certain uh, characteristics which are in common. And these inherited characteristics allow us to prove that they're all from a common ancestor. So that's, that's where it links in for evolutionary proof. Okay, perfect. 
So the plant groups of ferns, right, this is my example, the plant groups of ferns, conifers, and flowering plants were discovered to all have this structural similarity, such as vascular tissue. Um, you might have learned about xylems early on, the thing that carries water up the plant and whatnot, from the roots to the rest of the plant. So these xylems, these conducting vessels which transport water throughout the plant, uh, these suggested that since all these groups of plants have this xylem, that they must have come from a common ancestor. And th that's just another way of proving that everything does come from a common ancestor and hence allows us to prove that evolution is true. Cool. So, I've explained these three theories and we still have two more to go. So, the second one, the, I mean the second last that I'll be uh, explaining is comparative embryology. So, like, a, a sim similarity exists between the embryos of in, in general. So what comparative embryology is, is comparing two different organisms' embryos and seeing where the similarities lie and seeing if we can make any links. And these links allow us to once again prove that they were from either a common ancestor or they, are, they were similar uh, like organisms. Okay, so in my actual example, I used the similarity between uh, both chick and human embryos, where they both go through a stage which, where they have slits and arches in their necks. and just like the gill slit and gill arch arches of the fish, um, we don't actually end up using these, but we still have them in our embryos. So wh what I mean to say is that since these were in the embryos, the, the theory helps us support that the idea of both chicks and humans come from common ancestors. So here's a little diagram here showing uh, what I actually mean by that. Here's a chicken embryo, and here's all the, the gills and the slits and stuff. And that's a tail, that's a tail here. Human embryo, we've got the same thing. So this little similarity inside our embryos may help us support the fact that we come from common ancestors. Okay. And leaving my favorite to last, biochemistry. Biochemistry is actually studying a wide range of animals and having allowed for that discovery to uh, possess many similar molecules, you can actually check using the hemoglobin, RNA, and hormones um, if these organisms are similar in any sense or came from the same organism, uh, like common ancestor. What I mean by this is that through studying these proteins, scientists look at the amino acid sequences as a clue to relationships. So in DNA hybridization, uh, in my example, I've got two bird species. They're split and recombined as hybrid. The more heat it takes to split the, this hybrid, the more closely the birds are related. What that basically means is that these two DNA uh, parts, they're, they're mixed together. Now they're trying to take these uh, hi this hybrid, uh, up to, they're trying to split this hybrid using heat. Now to prove that they're um, joining and they're that they, they can actually, these two strands can actually perfectly match. If they do take a long time to uh, split, that means that it's it's very likely that the birds were closely re related. So DNA hybridization, it can be used to identify similarities in DNA structure. This is known as the chemical hybridization, which allows for comparison of DNA molecules from other species. All right. So I've just had a really quick rundown of every single one that we actually needed to look at. I've given you specific examples, and let's just hope you can remember this on the HSE day, because this stuff is absolutely crucial just to remember in your head. And it's stuff that, if you learn it, and if you understand the concepts, then the example should come to you, no worries. So I really do hope this helped, and see you next time.